Welcome to the 14th episode of our deep dive series on Canadian bank earnings. Today, we're covering the first quarter 2024 bank earnings announcements, and we're going to be returning each quarter on this channel to update you on the latest financial results. My name is Daniel Stanley. I'm an ETF specialist at BMO Exchange Traded Funds, and I'm joined today by my friends and colleagues, Chris Heeks, Portfolio Manager for all of BMO's equity and multi-asset ETFs, and Surab Mobahedi, Managing Director of Financials Research at BMO Capital Markets. Today, we're going to cover the recent bank earnings announcements and what they mean for investors and the Canadian economy, as well as looking at different ETF strategies that give you exposure to the Canadian banks. So without further ado, gentlemen, Chris and Surab, thank you for taking the time to join me. And, and Surab, as we often do, I want to start with you. Um, look, the Canadian economy, while no one's talking about being in recession, uh, growth certainly doesn't seem to be there. And that seems to be setting some expectations for the banks fairly low, and in particular heading into this earnings season. How, how did the banks do uh, this earnings season? So um, I'd say we started fiscal 2024, so we would have just reported the first quarter results um, in a little bit of a, a better than worried. How does that sound? Um, so what I mean by that is we were probably looking for the system-wide earnings year over year to be down around 10%. They reported actually something in the order of magnitude of 14.1% billion dollars for the quarter in after-tax earnings. And that was down about 8% from a year ago. So a little bit less than what we would, uh, you know, a little bit better, I suppose. Still $14 billion in earnings. I mean, I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that they are uh, profitable. And, um, and I suspect we are lapping, I'll call it, more difficult comps. <laughs> you know, when we look at these growth and we're comparing them to prior years, I, I think we're coming close to lapping these more difficult comps in the next quarter. It, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick my neck out here a little bit and say probably another quarter where we may see negative uh, earnings growth, still po positive, obviously, earnings, but from a comparability perspective, but likely to see that turn now and probably turn positive certainly by Q3 when we look at the year-over-year -year stuff and into into the year end and certainly into 2025. I, I'd say that, uh, you know, when we when you look at our reaction, let's say, to the results, you know, we tweaked estimates a little bit up and down, generally up, uh, down for TD, but on, you know, in totality, we didn't really think of the quarter as a material in terms of revisions to estimates, nor did we view it as material in terms of revisions to uh, valuation multiples. No, thanks for that, sir. I mean, I, and I love that emphasis on the fact that they still had $14 billion of earnings, which, you know, as Canadians who are uh, invested in banks, whether it's through the individual securities or through the ETF or through mutual funds, that those dividends that are churned out from that uh, are, are, are in a good position. Chris, I want to transition over to you because, uh, you know, we, we tend to spend some time watching the individual bank stocks. Maybe can you talk a little bit about how the individual bank stocks reacted to those Q1 earnings announcements? And how did that compare to, you know, the performance of the ZEB, which is the BMO Equal Weight Bank ETF? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, 14 billion, that's a lot. Uh, as our good friend, Bar Brian Belsky in Capital Markets said, billions with a B. So he, you know, that's that's that, that's big numbers. Um, yeah, in terms of the price action, it was generally positive. So, you know, as a reminder, last quarter, we saw really around earnings, the best kind of price action we've seen in terms of upwards price action on banks and kind of a few quarters. Uh, the average bank on, on the under earnings announcement day moved about 1.7%. And in Q4, and there were several that were 3, 4, 5%. A uh, little more muted this quarter, but still positive. Uh, so you had uh, Commerce and National both moved uh, up 2%. Uh, bank of Nova Scotia moved up 3%, and they were the big laggard in Q4. They've 
They look like, uh, you know, the market's becoming more receptive to some of the changes that are happening there. Uh, unfortunately uh, for us, and on the call, uh, BMO was the laggard down three, um, you know, and we, we have been up 2% in the last quarter. But, uh, you know, net net, you know, the average uh, bank was up about approximately uh, 1% on the quarter. And, uh, you know, just a little more on the price action, you know, for ZEB now, which is, as you mentioned, the BMO Canadian Equal Weight Banks ETF, uh, we're up about 1.6% for the year. Um, it had really rallied into the earnings announcements as well as out of. So I think that's a nice thing to see from a, from a price perspective. Uh, banks kind of started the year a little bit, a uh, little bit negative. Um, but from mid-February, um, we're up about 5%. And so mid-February was about two weeks before earnings. And then now we're, we're a couple of weeks on the other side of earnings. So, you know, in general, I think these trends are, are pretty positive. Um, it's nice to hear what Saurabh said in terms of, well, we don't like being down 8% at a bank, but being down 8 is better than down 10. So that's certainly nice to hear. You know, I think there's been some favorable macro trends, which are really been the difference makers to equities in general. You know, going back to last November where, you know, the Fed started talking about um, interest rate cuts a little bit more and then the market really became uh, more constructive around uh, a no landing or a very soft landing scenario. So certainly that's helped broad markets and and, and, and banks, you know, north and south of the border as well. So, uh, you know, that's part of it. But uh, yeah, you know, always great to see positive momentum. And, and a lot of times in equity investing, positive momentum, you know, momentum tends to carry through. So we'll see how that evolves, but a, a good start to the year. Yeah, no, that, that's great, Chris. Thank you. And, and you're right about the macro. Uh, and, and it certainly helps being a neighbor to the United States with the growth in their U.S. economy. Um, and that sort of bodes well for the Canadian banks, for sure. So, Rob, I want to come back to you here because, you know, your thesis last quarter was that the Canadian banks were at, at this inflection point uh, and that 2023 was going to be that year that everyone wants to forget. And you, you've kind of alluded to that, but maybe given what you saw and heard last week, does, does 2024 look to be a better year? And, and if so, why? Look, I think uh, 2024, certainly with the benefit of the first quarter results, actual results and obviously management commentary and uh, the outlook that they're providing. I think I think the thesis we shared with you is still intact. We are probably, you know, it's always hard to say, well, December ended, you know, January started, so 20, we're in 24. You know, I would say there's always a little bit of a, these don't shift, they transition. What did we get this quarter, which I think is encouraging and supportive of the thesis we had provided? Number one, uh, for example, uh, a number of the banks have discounts on their dividend reinvestment programs as a way of issuing shares to basically shore up their capital levels for, for regulatory requirement purposes and for obviously for uh, when you're downside focused, you want to have higher capital levels. Well, uh, uh, they've indicated uh, at least three of the four banks have given us the actual dates they're going to turn those uh, discounts off, and the fourth one is likely to do it <laughs> uh, when they report their results next quarter, as far as giving us a date. That's a net positive because we're not, you know, capital levels are not continuously grinding higher. Certainly, we've had, and we talked about this last quarter, the, the regulator is not pushing the domestic stability buffer any higher. That's a net positive. You know, in the context of regulatory peer pressure, I mean, yesterday we got a sense out of the U.S. that maybe the uh, the, the suggested Basel III endgame is not going to be implemented with the same kind of voracity and severity as it was implied in the U.S. I think that takes a little bit of regulatory peer pressure off. So I think capital levels, just so that we're here in Canada, we're targeting 11 and a half from a regulatory minimum perspective. The banks were well clear of that 12 and a half to, I would say 12 and a half to 13 and a half percent, even after you pro forma, for example, Royal Bank for the pending HSBC acquisition and you take a placeholder, a placeholder for some of the charges that a penalty that TD is likely have to, they're going to have to pay for its issues. So I would say capital, not a concern. And, you know, we got indications that uh, we may be 
near the peak of uh, reserve building in anticipation of future credit losses. Now, remember that under IFRS 9, which was implemented in 2018, the banks are now on a proactive or pro-cyclical basis <laughs> adding to their reserves, whereas historically, credit may have been more of a lagging indicator. We may have seen re-ratings on the banks after we had seen the peak of the provisioning. I think we're starting to see the peak of the provisioning, and I think investors should take note that those provisionings are happening probably on average a year earlier than they would have historically because of some accounting changes. Um, you know, CIBC, as an example, would have been a leading indicator of commercial real estate and office commercial real estate in the U.S. in particular. They were uh, early reserve builders, and they would be the one of the ones that suggested that, you know, knowing what they know about their portfolio, obviously it's idiosyncratic to their portfolio, they believe that reserve building is materially behind them, for example, as far as the U.S. office commercial real estate portfolio is concerned. So this doesn't mean to say that we won't see headlines around bankruptcies or uh, Canadian consumer leverage or what have you. But if we are indeed in a bit of a soft landing type scenario, which I think has become consensus, and we are going to have rate cuts, and we believe our economics department has a June kind of as a first rate cut, and so call it back half of the year, we see the pressures around credit quality and reserving in anticipation of impairments lessening. Okay. So we then think you can start transitioning your views into top line growth, into uh, revenue driven pre-tax pre-provision growth, and uh, ultimately start talking about higher ROEs again. And you know, I can't promise you we're there yet. I think everything we've seen would suggest we're very close to that point. And in fact, we would argue that investors should start thinking you know, about the transition <laughs> towards more offense, less defense, so to speak, as it were, uh, with respect uh, to, to their bank holdings and their portfolios. Or, or to use, uh, I guess, another analogy, Surab, it's, it's the headwinds of reserve building, the headwinds of, of uh, regulatory issues that I, I know when we spoke roughly around this time last year, after what happened in the U.S., you said that one of the worries was that uh, the hangover of regulatory peer pressure. So it sounds like what you're saying, in effect, is that the headwinds of, of, of these two issues are sort of possibly behind us, and that we can focus on the tailwinds of, of looking at that top line growth, which is which is really exciting. Um, Chris, I want to uh, come over to you now, because in addition to uh, ZEB, we also have ZWB, the BMO Covered Call uh, Canadian Bank ETF. For those who want income, uh, we've also got ZBI, uh, the Canadian Bank Income Index ETF, for those who want bonds and PREF shares. And then more recently, we launched ZEBA, which is the Canadian Bank Accelerator ETF, uh, for those who are basically bullish on the Canadian banks and, and want a little bit of uh, greater upside uh, with a uh, with a cap. So I'm curious, Chris, given the conditions that you've sort of heard Sorap describe, is, is there any one of those particular ETFs or a mix of ETFs that, that you'd look to given what you've heard? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And, and I thought I thought it would, uh, you know, I thought it would be um, interesting and, and, and productive to, to talk a little bit about ZBI, the Canadian Banking Income ETF, because this is really more of a fixed income tool. And we're obviously talking about equities when we're talking about banks. But, you know, as investors, um, you know, we, we generally have fixed income as well as equities to diversify, you know, the overall portfolio. Uh, we launched this fund about two years ago. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say it hasn't been a, a huge star to the gate. But what, what I would argue now is we're starting to see uh, the value of the strategy. Um, and we're seeing a much more constructive, uh, you know, banks movement in the last few months and is translating on the fixed income side of the portfolio as well. So just to kind of very briefly, you know, what is, what is in the portfolio, it's all big six banks, uh, bonds and preferred shares. So it's about 60% bonds and they tend to be tilted towards the shorter end. So kind of between 
zero in 10 years of maturity. And then 40% um, um, hybrid instruments like preferred shares. Um, so, uh, you know, what the hybrid instruments do is they, they allow that income to increase. There's higher yield on the preferred shares versus the bonds. Uh, you're looking at a, a yield to maturity on this project of about 5.6%. Um, and for a couple of bond comparables, um, Zag, our, our uh, BMO uh, aggregate bond index ETF. So the aggregate bond universe in Canada, you're about 4.3% YTM. If you just look at corporate bonds, you know, banks are obviously corporate bonds. You, know, you, you get a bit of a pickup, you're at 49 But again, uh, with the Canadian Bank Income ETF, you're at 56 uh, you know, what are the advantages of the bonds? Obviously, bonds in general uh, carry less volatility than equities as well. So the one-year volatility of uh, this bond ETF is about 5%. It's kind of in line with fixed income, right? It's it's a fixed income exposure. ZEB would have 50%. That's an equity level of risk. So it's about a third of that mark-to-market risk. And, you know, I found it quite interesting on a one-year uh, perspective, which obviously there's been a lot of, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to remember everything that's happened in a year, but there's been, you know, certainly lots of ups and downs, and we kind of expect that going forward. Um, you know, Canadian banks were on the equity side doing pretty poorly to start the year last year and into the middle of the year, and then really had that kind of rena- uh, renaissance in Q4 and, and kind of carrying over into this year. Uh, but on a one-year basis, the return of ZBI is, is almost 8%, 7.9. And if you look at ZEB, it's about 5%. So I'm not going to suggest that bonds, you would expect them to give more return over the long period of time. But in certain environments, they can be very effective, especially when equities aren't doing as well. So, you know, if we're arguing for the benefits of banks, I think as an investor, you can consider, okay, obviously we're considering banks on the equity side of the portfolio. You know, what can they do on the fixed income side of the portfolio as well? So, um, you know, I think it's actually a very good product. It's, it's really showing um, showing some merits, you know, now as we get into our going into the, our third year of this product, uh, being out into the market. And so I think that's a very interesting one to have on the, your portfolio. You know, I, I, in general, would advocate for a tilt to banks over time because of, you know, that, that it tends to give a better a richer return over time. And again, that can that can help on the fixed income as well as the equity. And uh, so, uh, yeah, just want to spend a bit of time there. You know, on the equity side, just to, just to echo, um, you know, given the conditions, you know, Saurabh sort of outlined um, in terms of playing offense. You know, I think that's ZEB is your is your best tool. It's simple, it's effective. Equities, very low management fee, all in one package, rebalances twice a year, um, and so that's that's going to be a very effective tool to play offense. You know, of course, if you are an income investor, income oriented investor, the ZWB is always a great tool. It gives you more income, a little less growth. Um, but, you know, I think for a lot of investors still playing in the total return space, you know, keep keep it simple, as they say. And ZDB is a great tool to do that on the equity side. Oh, thanks for that, Chris. I, I, I think it's timely, certainly with the next question I want to ask Surab. But again, I think we tend to forget that the banks are big bond issuers and and, and it's high quality uh, corporate debt in effect. And, and uh, you know, at a 5.6% yield of maturity, uh, it, it can be attractive. Um, Surab, it's a great segue into my next question for you, because we, we've talked about the different you know, the, the difference between risk to the balance sheet, risk to the income statement. Um, and, and I've seen this talked about a little bit more in the news lately. Can you just give us a quick overview of those risks and, and which are sort of more or less serious when it comes to the Canadian banks at this point in this cycle? I think, uh, you know, whenever we're going through a bit of a downturn, and I'm talking about an economic downturn, I mean, these are balance sheet intensive businesses. We all know that. They make money by taking deposits and making loans. So, um, you know, when economic risk increases, when risk of, uh, you know, economic contraction increases, they're like, you know, the the worry is not every loan made under certain assumptions is going to be, you know, be made good, right? So what we worry about usually with the balance sheet risk is, hey, do they have enough good loans? have they adequately allowed for potential loan losses? And do they have the earnings to absorb? Because earnings and income statement will be your first line of defense, really, when you have um, hits coming at you. 
So, so when you think about that, you know, obviously Canadian consumer leverage is a concern. A, a very large portion of the system-wide balance sheet is Canadian mortgages. We certainly have had to uh, absorb, or when I say we, uh, clients or investors or, uh, sorry, mortgage holders have had to absorb a relative rate shock, right? In, in other words, um, if you were in a variable rate mortgage and your rates are going up, there's a tendency <laughs> to feel the pain of that. Now, some banks would have had a feature that allowed you to adjust your amortization period to, to maintain your um, monthly payments. A couple of the banks would not have had that feature. But long and short of it is the the measures that are in the system, ultimately, I think, in place from a bank shareholder perspective for the banks to get their money back, right? Like we're, we're in, not in a rush to write off loans if we can, you know, rehabilitate the borrower, if we could work with that borrower. When I say we, I mean the banks, obviously, to work with the borrowers. And it certainly looks like those measures have gone according to plan, right? So we've extended, the banks have extended amortizations, but clients have been able to then also make good on the promises they've made as far as the reject kind of uh, long, long terms. I mean, I think a saving grace, let's be honest here, has been that the employment picture has remained still constructive. So, you know, reminder again that if... People are working. They don't want to, they're not looking to default on their debt. And so, as I say, like when we look at some of the broad stroke stuff and it's been a tough year, right? Like, I mean, when you think about this increase in rates and the pressure it would have put on, on the business of <laughs> lending at the same time that it would have put pressure on the business of deposits, right? Like, to, 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 and squeeze some of the margin that some of the banks are making, like, some of this has been largely absorbed and you know for people like me people some like you guys that are in the capital markets we also know that we we have experienced a prolonged period of uh subdued activity in capital markets businesses these are important parts of the revenues for the bank so when you think about the income statement um we've had a little bit of pressure if you will on credit provisioning Probably not enough support coming from fee businesses when you think back over the last, call it 12 months or 12 to 24 months, and you've had this, um, you know, economic contraction worry, which probably has sub subdued loan growth demand <laughs> or loan demand, which kind of weighs on loan growth. We've had some, um, uh, we are going through this transition in rates, which has implications for cost of borrowing and credit spreads. Much of that... I can't say 100% of that is done, but we've absorbed a lot of that. And as we look ahead, uh, we we, not, uh, we expect loan growth is going to remain subdued, but we expect fee businesses, whether it's wealth, whether it's capital markets, some of those things we're going to start pick, picking up. And, and, uh, and ultimately, a, a, a bit of a more favorable rate environment consistent maybe with a bit of a more favorable economic backdrop, if you want to call it the soft landing type scenario, something that avoids the, you know, the infamous kind of recession or, you know, the big <laughs> leg down. I think all of that lessens the risk on balance sheet, lessens the concern on the downside and starts to transition the focus to the upside. And so if, if some of these revenues we're talking about come through. The banks obviously took restructuring charges late last year. Some of the benefits are of those are going to come through probably towards the second half of this year and into 2025. So that will manage expenses. You should be able to get operating leverage without the headwinds of credit reserve building coming at you. You, you have a reasonably good setup and, and obviously easier comps. <laughs> I know it's 14 billion, but it's down, right? So you know, easier comps will allow for a bit more growth. And so, like I said, I don't want to pound the table, but I, I think there are reasons consistent with the thesis we had talked, you know, probably over the last quarter as well to to start uh, feeling a little bit more optimistic on the outlook. 
no, that's a great story because the uh, the news tends to be uh, less focused on the optimistic side. But again, I go, I, I go back to that. These are um, you know companies that have fourteen billion dollars of earnings. They pay a healthy dividend, and uh, so it's nice to hear that we're we're a little bit more optimistic uh, in the future. So, guys, I want to finish up. Normally, I ask both of you one question, but I'm at, I'm going to close things off. Chris, I want to start with one question for you. Because it was almost exactly a year ago that we had all those problems with the, the U.S. regional banks. You know, how does, fast forward a year, you know, how does that U.S. banking sector look one year later? And, you know, what has there been any spillover to Canada, if any? Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll start with the U.S. and I'll uh, put some comments and yes, Sarab can, can add on it and talk about the spillover to Canada. But, you know, in terms of what we've seen in the U.S., certainly better. I mean, to start with that, is a lot better than it was a, a year ago. Um, you know, obviously that was a, a significant drawdown uh, in, in U.S. banks, and they've they've been digging out of the hole. So ZUB, which is the BMO uh, U.S. bank uh, hedged to CAD ETF, uh, is up about thirty nine percent since uh, mid March a year ago when when uh, when 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 all that uh, was happening. Um, I think it's worthy to note that uh, there's another bank that's that's going through some stuff, but you know it looks like the market has jumped through it and contained it. So this was the NYCB, New York Commercial Bank. Um, I understand it was mostly commercial loans, perhaps real estate. I'm not sure the exact nature, but uh, a hedge fund came in and bailed them out. So that looks isolated. You know, in general, uh, much more constructive. I think those macro tailwinds, uh, you know that were mentioned, I think, you know, I've obviously been su super constructive and then, you know, so, uh, you know, just echo on so rap, you know, in terms of risks, you know, the, econ the economy is the largest risk uh, to the banks and especially south of the border, I think. And, um, and, and so this, um, you know, idea that we're getting a soft landing or no landing is certainly constructive. And, and, you know, given they sold off a lot, you know, a lot of times that gives room on the upside uh, after a large sell off, like we saw last year. So, Generally constructive, uh, you know, Saraba also mentioned the the uh, the regulatory easement that the Powell was speaking about yesterday. Um, obviously, that's always um, that's always constructive as well. So there's there's some constructive trends, you know, the risks that remain. You know, obviously, it's the economy, I think, is the, is the big one. And, and that'll have to be gauged and monitored going forward. Uh, we're seeing uh, a little bit of a higher for longer in terms of interest rate policy that's being messaged by by the Fed now. Now, equity investors haven't uh, reacted overly to this, but you, you know, you wonder if that persists. You know, does that take some of the shine off of a possible no landing? Because I, I think you know, higher for longer will naturally play into more of a landing, you know, harder landing, right? Potentially. So I think that's the risk people to watch, but but lots of construct uh, constructiveness um, to uh, you know that we've seen in the past mm -hmm. year. So thank you. Certainly, they've got the the advantage of the uh, the U.S. economic growth engine, which just seems to be trucking along. Uh, it's, it's it's impressive. So, Reb, I want to uh, end off with you. Uh, your thoughts on an issue that has been uh, top of mind for a lot of people. Uh, you know, we're hearing uh, about from the Canadian banks, and 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 just talk to us about Canadian banks and their outlook for commercial real estate. Yeah, I mean, I think commercial real estate has a broad theme. Uh, you know, I think all the banks, whether north or south of the border, certainly Canadian banks would disaggregate commercial real estate between at least, you know, office, multifamily, industrial. And I think the pocket of commercial real estate that has been obviously attracting a lot of the attention has been the U.S. office commercial real estate. Just to put things into kind of some perspective, broader commercial real estate portfolio of the Canadian banks, this would be their global portfolios, primarily U.S. and Canada, maybe represents about 10% of their overall loan book. And of that, maybe one, depending on the bank, one to 2% of the loan book may be in office, uh, U.S. office commercial real estate. So I think, um, uh, and as real estate, I think usually goes, you know, it it's location, location, location. I think a lot of the banks will tell you that, uh, you know, uh, two buildings across the street from, from each other could have different, uh, you know, capital structures, different, you know, the age of the building will matter. There's a variety of things that factor in. I think what matters is what I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, that 
if CIBC was the leading indicator here, they are now in telling us that for their portfolio, uh, which probably had enough of the regionals, uh, the, the risky regions of the U.S. in it, they're telling us that having gone through the renewal cycle, like I said, for most of it, uh, nearly half of it, they feel like they have been able to assess the risks <laughs> in, in a way that they feel comfortable that they've reserved and provided for them. So I think commercial real estate, office commercial real estate, for example, um, and generally speaking, again, I'm, I'm not trying to declare victory on credit, but I think as far as the implications of credit quality degradation in credit portfolio and need for reserve building is going to increasingly become a rear view mirror item uh, for the banks. If, if it's not next quarter, then it will be the quarter after that. But for the most part, the reserve building, whether it's for consumer credit in Canada, whether it's for negative amortizing mortgages, <laughs> or whether it's for uh, credit cards, or whether it's for auto loans, or whether it's for commercial real estate, I think the Canadian banks have been uh, um, reserving at a pace that makes us feel comfortable. They are adequate. I'm not suggesting they're over reserved. We're suggesting they're adequately reserved for the economic backdrop that we uh, are planning on, which is this kind of call it softish lending type scenario. You know, that's great. That's a great way to end. At the end of the day, they're doing a good job of managing those reserves and uh, irrespective of the the environment that they can't control. And, and I think that's a great way to close off our discussion today. Uh, Chris and Sorab, thank you very, very much. I've, uh, like I said, I, I always love to uh, love these sessions. We get some true facts on what's going on on the ground uh, with the banks. As a reminder to the audience, you can get exposure to the Canadian banks via ZEB, which is the uh, BMO Equal Weight Banks Index ETF. Uh, you can get exposure to our U.S. banks uh, ETF, uh, which is ZUB, ZBK, the BMO Equal Weight U.S. Uh, banks index ETF. If you have any questions, please visit the ETF center at bmoetfs.com. That's all for today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Please join us for our next session when we update you on Canadian bank earnings. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at etfmarketinsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.